I'm Jen Mellon. Welcome to Come Home. You know, today's a great day. You're alive, the sun's in the sky, the birds are chirping, and God is on the throne. And He is a good, good Father, and He has good, good things for you today. Do you believe it? Well, you're watching, so I know you're gonna be blessed and ministered to. Grab your coffee. I've got my Tishri coffee mug, which is the seventh Hebrew month, and it is a fabulous month. It begins 5783, our new spiritual year, so that's so exciting. Listen, this next guest does not really need much introduction. We've shown you to her and exposed you to her. She is Dr. Michelle Correll. She is a profound Bible teacher. She is a woman of the word. She leads a very consecrated life. She studies and prays nine hours a day. So when she opens her mouth, the word comes out. And you know, I have this pink Bible, but when she was uh, here, her Bible was this thick with sticky notes everywhere. And it, it was just, it was like a living, active sword. But today she's going to be sharing some wonderful truths from the book of Nehemiah. 13 short chapters, but here we see a man who was a builder. Are you a builder? And he saw a problem. He saw that there was destruction and ruin, that there was devastation. And he said, I'm going to do something about it. He answered the call of obedience. And today she's going to share with you about the different gates, resumes uh, for revival. Because look, for God to use you, there's got to be a resume. Some of you are going through some tough times, some big challenges, but they're developing your character. They are positioning and preparing you for your greatest journey yet. She's going to share, we're going to be encouraged, we're going to grow, we're going to learn. And that is what this walk of faith is all about, practicing for eternity. This is just a boot camp. Everything you're going through, ladies and gentlemen, is going to make a difference. So let's go to a quick brain hack, and then we're going to go straight to Dr. Michelle Carell. I'll see you in a minute. I'm Nancy. Welcome back to Brain Hacks. And I'm Christy, a soul medic from Soul Medics 360. You think about knowing something with your brain, but we're going to talk about how to fix your knower today. One of the things that sabotages our knowing and how can we know things is the tendency to operate alone and get on a device and start flipping through a computer program and, and focusing on this and it creates this alone kind of sensation. Whereas if we're having coffee and talking and working eye to eye, I know I'm not alone, but we need each other. When you feel alone, it tends to make us very self-centered and that's not a very healthy way to be. Yeah, loneliness is actually one of the big problems with people who are fighting depression. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to isolate more mm -hmm. and that's actually the wrong thing to do. And I wrote a brain tune-up that I, I actually is on our website. People can take it, listen to it. But what you need to really understand that in order to tune up your brain, you have to be part of a community. Yes. And sometimes you may have to go out there and shop communities. You know, God has put me in communities I never imagined being part of uh, because I was open. And as light bearers, as Christians, we're called to go, and it's not always a community that we necessarily know and might be comfortable with. I didn't know a thing about this whole NFT world, and all of a sudden, he put me in a community of NFT people and a community of trucking people. And, you know, you just have to be flexible because God wants to use us all. Yes. We can't Where, limit him. Wherever you go, though, it's very important that you live in love and confidence and you can reach out and touch people. Just us touching, that's sharing electricity. Yes. It's been said that we need about 19 hugs a day to have the proper ionic flow. 
So just when someone hugs you, it's so restorative. Don't you feel that? Yeah, and actually a smile naturally re uh, releases dopamine. And so we just went through a period where a lot of people weren't Couldn't smiling even see as much. Their face with right. a mask. So, you know, if you're not getting the smiles, you're not naturally producing this dopamine that you would get by meeting somebody, eye contact, getting smiles, receiving smiles, and that helps set your moods. So I'm telling you, there is so many things that are interconnected. And I want to touch on this energy transfer. Yes. As Christians, you know, there's some biblical scriptures that talk about laying hands on people. And Jesus actually did this before he put the saliva in the guy's eyes that were blind, right? So I believe because we are energy carriers, we are energy bearers, we yes. can transfer positive energy that laying hands, we're actually transferring some of our energy to another person because we love them. And this is part of the, how a plant response, the, the, the green thumb phenomenon. Yes. Yes. Because you can literally see an organic plant as it is receiving the love of somebody who loves to plant, it will thrive more than somebody who just goes and throws some water on it. Many of you have seen those experiments by the Japanese scientist where he's speaking to the water and it impacts the water. Um, we want that all Christians everywhere would live in confidence and fear touching, loving, connecting, because this is the opposite of isolating and being withdrawn and alone on your devices, addicted to gaming and, and those kind of habits that are counterproductive to a healthy brain. Yeah, I wanna just wrap up real quick. That experiment, experiment you referenced is on the brain tune-up kit that you can actually see that water experiment as yeah. well as I do feature it in my book. So it is very powerful information. That's right. Check it out, soulmedics360.com. We're gonna end with this today. Your brain has a left and right hemisphere and you can recalibrate it with this simple trick. If you reach out, there's a little pressure point right here. You can touch your daughter, son, friend, and recalibrate their brain by just holding those two pressure points and very gently going back and forth. When you look at them in their left eye, which goes to their right brain, and say some life-giving words, like if I said to Christy, everything's going to be okay, Christy, and I would be looking right at her left eye, that goes into her relational circuitries and resets her brain. It brings such peace when you speak blessing, left eye going to right brain. So touch right here on their wrist gently with their permission and then you can speak a blessing. You'll be a blessing. Thank you. Today, I want to share with you something that I believe will change your life. We are going to look at the book of Nehemiah. You know the name Nehemiah in Hebrew, Nehemia, literally means the Lord comforts. And you see, we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Nehemiah. But I want us to see, first of all, Nehemiah chapter one, which is going to lead us to our subject matter today, repairing the ruins of revival. I believe today it is God's will to bring revival to the church and especially to the believers here in America that maybe feel discouraged. I want to speak to you today about the book of Nehemiah that I believe will open the doors for revival in our own lives. First of all, Nehemiah in the background was a man of God who demonstrates Christian uh, leadership, not only leadership in the church, but sets a biblical, a biblical platform of what leadership is all about. Whenever we see in the Bible a person being given a platform, a person being given a sphere of influence, a person given a scepter of influence, a place of influence or a platform, the Bible will always give us a resume. And the resume for Nehemiah is selflessness. You see, the Bible has certain qualities that qualify one for leadership. And in the book 
of Nehemiah. We see along with Esther, we see along with Daniel, we see along with David, we see along with all of those mighty men and women of God who ascended to a place of greatness and shook the world for God. We see that they all have a resume that the Bible gives to us before the, the Bible introduces us to that person. There is always a spiritual resume that is given to us concerning one of the character traits that qualified them for leadership because there are character traits that God uses and character traits that God refuses. And in this case with Nehemiah, it is selfless leadership because the platform is not about us. When we learn that God gives us a platform to benefit others, then we will realize we are responsible for our sphere of influence. And Nehemiah used his platform completely responsibly for others, the same way Esther did. She used that throne to save her nation, the same way David did, to, to enthrone the throne of God and to turn all of Israel to worship God. The same way Moses used his influence. Uh, you and I must understand, beloved people, God is calling us. Here we see Nehemiah evidently sent, uh, sent an entourage ahead of him to look at the, the ruins of Zion. And they came back with a report that Zion and the people that were in Zion were in great reproach and that the gates, walls were broken down and the gates were burnt with fire. The Bible tells us his response to that was weeping and that he went before the king and he risked his life. The king sent him forth to Zion. And I want to speak to you today about how Nehemiah rebuilt the ruins of Zion. We cannot confuse Nehemiah with Ezra. Ezra rebuilt the temple, but Nehemiah rebuilt the walls and rebuilt the city. And what did he do when he rebuilt Zion? The first thing he is going to do is that Nehemiah is going to repair the ruins on the wall. If you notice in Nehemiah chapter 3, the Bible speaks of these 10 gates these 10 gates that needed to be repaired. And I want you to understand that every sing, single one of the gates are, are being called to be repaired. Now, they were burnt with fire. Notice we see in chapter 1, verse 3, the gates thereof are burnt with fire. So the question arises, how did they get burnt with fire? They got burnt with fire in the Babylonian captivity when the Babylonians took over and crushed the whole entire city of Zion and made it ground zero, burnt the temple and burnt the city and took out all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And there was not anyone left in all of, of Jerusalem. And so therefore, 70 years later, Nehemiah is going back to rebuild the wall, but before the wall can be built, the breaches in the gates must be built. Beloved saints, I want you to understand, first of all, what gates means in Hebrew. Gates are not just entrance ways to go to another, from one point to the next. A gate, the gates in the cities were ordered by God throughout all of Israel. And the gates were little square places. For example, you enter into a gate and then there was like a square town meeting uh, location. And there would be another gate to actually go into the city. So it was a small little plaza. And in those gates, there would be deliberation, of, uh, actually a deliberation to vindicate individuals who had nowhere to turn, who were being oppressed, by rich landowners or being falsely accused. So the judges of the city would meet together and they would deliberate cases to defend the poor, to defend the rights of the widow, to defend the orphan, to set up justice, to declare that there would be no robbery or bribery or any wicked thing that would be in the city. So the gates of every city are considered holy. 
And the gates of Zion, the Bible says, and Psalm 82 verse, Psalm 87 verse 2, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob, meaning the holy deliberation in Zion set up by David's system was the holiest of all. So we see that the repairing of the ruins is going to have to take place. And so the first thing that Nehemiah does is he repairs the sheep gate. Then he repairs the fish gate. Then he repairs the old gate. And I want to speak to you. There are 10 gates about the three first gates. And the gates actually represent repairing the ruins of the church. Because why? These gates are entrances into Jerusalem, but prophetically, they also represent entrances into the presence of God. Some of us have not been able to feel God's presence for so long. Some of us have been without direction. Some of us have been without hope. Some of us have been empty and saying, God, where are you? I don't feel your anointing anymore. Some of us have said, where is God in America? Where is God in the church? Where is God among us? We don't feel it anymore. But Nehemiah shows us, number one, the Babylon Babylonians burnt the walls with fire. Throughout the Bible, the Babylonians are not just a people from Chaldea. I want you to understand that the Babylonians, oftentimes Babylon, also has a spiritually synonymous similitude that Babylon is very much associated with the world and the system of this world. And so those of us who are wondering what is going on, why can't we feel the power of God in our church anymore? Why can't we feel the presence of God among us anymore? It is because the gates of Zion have been built. You see, the name Zion in Hebrew is a name that means marked. It was a territory in Jerusalem that that David marked for the presence of God. And we have been marked. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are spiritual Zion. So the gates, let me name them. The first one is the sheep gate. And the sheep gate had to be repaired and sanctified. And this is the only gate that the Bible speaks of was sanctified and it was sanctified twice. And the repairer of those ruins was the high priest. I want you to understand, dear people of God, Jesus Christ is the high priest. And I want you to understand he's repaired the gate that you and I can enter into the presence of God. The, the sheep gate was also the sacrifice gate. And I want you to know many of us have lost the spirit of sacrifice in our lives. The world and the system of the world has burnt the gates with fire. We believe that serving God is just one of convenience, but the actual way that we serve God is through total surrender to the spirit of God in all things, laying our life on the altar, not to do our will, but to do the will of God. Jesus said in John chapter 6, I came not to do my own will. In John chapter 5 verse 30, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. You see, it is so important that we again sacrifice our will to God. Not my will, but thine be done. And there's a repairing that the Holy Ghost wants to do right now in the church, that we again would lay our lives down as living sacrifices and do whatever God asks. The second gate that needs to be repaired is the fish gate. Now, I want you to know that in these gates are bolts and locks. Why? Because there are some truths in the Bible that will never change. They are eternal. And all of the gates that Nehemiah repaired and that he ordered to be repaired were bolted. They represent eternal truths. We cannot change the Bible. We cannot change God's laws. We cannot change our mentality. A culture cannot tell us 
how we worship. You and I must understand, we must submit ourselves to the eternal word of God. And so therefore the fish gate was a gate where all Galilean fishermen entered into to sell their fish. And this is prophetic because you and I have been called to be fishers of men, but there's a price to pay for discipleship. Jesus said, unless a man forsake everything he has, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus, when he put his hand on Peter said, I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible says that James and John, when they were called by Jesus, forsook everything to follow him. If we want revival, we have to repair the fish gate, be willing to give everything up, no matter what it costs, to do the will of God. And the third gate today that I'm going to speak to you about is my favorite gate. It's the old gate. The old gate was bolted up. It was repaired. And it was, it was uh, repaired by those Nehemiah appointed. What is the old gate? The old gate is the word gate. The old gate is found in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible says, I am wisdom. The Lord possessed me of old. These are the commandments of God in his word that never change. These are the commandments, the laws, the precepts, the, uh, the teaching of God's word that changes not. We need to repair the old gate and find ourselves back into the presence of God. And there are people in the old gate that show us the way. There are those who went before us in the generation before us, in generations before us. I see the John Wesleys in the old gate. I see the Mariah Woodworth Edders in the old gate. We see the Corey Ten Booms in the old gate. They show us a path. They show us a path of faithfulness to God, faithfulness to God's word, uncompromising belief. And so today, Father God, in Jesus' name, let the anointing fall on everyone who has heard this and bring revival now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, this is Jeremy Rosado. This is Reva Watkins. This is Ron Leaf. And I'm Nancy Leaf. I'm Ruth Mangicapri. This is Dr. Robert Watkins, and you're watching CTN. And we're glad you are. Thank you for making CTN a part of your day. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. I'm glad you tuned in today. God bless you, and thank you for watching Come Home with Jen Mallon. I love rich teaching. I love unpacking the word and, and digging deep. So that was such a great teaching. I really love the idea of a spiritual resume. Doesn't that help you reframe your life differently? Everything you've gone through is really just an experience, a sentence, and a bullet point to put on your spiritual resume. All those things that were hurtful, painful, the wounds, the misunderstandings, the wilderness seasons, the dry seasons, all of those were developing your character, preparing you. And you know, Dr. Michelle also talked about surrender and selflessness. Now we live in a culture that screams selfishness. In fact, so many of our children and grandchildren have a very entitled mentality. But when you go to the Word, and, and ladies and gentlemen, we live our life from the Word of God. When you go to the Word, we see how Jesus learned obedience unto death. We see that Jesus came and was completely unselfish in how He walked about. He went about doing good, healing all, all, all. God wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you from selfishness or any other thing that could be plaguing you. Now, one of the great remedies for selfishness is the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. All of those fruits are, are counterintuitive 
to our, our, our spirit man. Those are the things we engage in. Those are the things the Holy Spirit help us with. So I just pray after this teaching today that you'll really say, God, I wanna be more like you. And I realize that I've gotta to die to flesh, crucify my flesh, take up my cross and follow you with my whole heart. Now, some of you might be saying, well, I don't know how to do that. I mean, I went to church as a child. I did catechism. You know, I, I was confirmed, but I don't know really what it is to have a relationship with Abba, with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. Well, today I'd like you to pray with me because that's really all it takes is having a hunger, a desire and being willing to let go of you and receive him into your heart, to ask him to forgive you for all sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to begin a new journey walking with him. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make because it determines your eternal destination. So repeat these words after me if you'd like to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ or if you'd like to receive him into your heart for the first time as your Lord and your savior. Just repeat this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, who surrendered, who led a selfless life, who gave himself as a sacrifice, an offering for me. Jesus, thank you for the price you paid, for the blood you shed, for the cost of Calvary, I receive you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse me from all sin. I repent. And today, I am a new creature. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. Holy Spirit, I give you my life. I follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. That's all it takes. You are now a kingdom citizen. You are a child of God. I encourage you to write in, let us know. You can call the prayer line. You can find other programs like this. You need a local church. You need to be discipled to grow in the things of God, but you've made the best decision ever. Now, I too was saved on Christian television in 1990 in my grandmother's living room, just like you are right now. Isn't that awesome? I will ask you this. If this program has been a blessing to you, if you'd like to partner with us, contribute monthly, give to us, we need people like you that believe in this vision, believe in Christian media, and believe in continuing the work. So pray for us, partner with us, and please consider giving on a monthly basis. I'm so grateful for you. Come home, I'm Jen Mallon.